there, there are many potential explanations for why somebody has ongoing complaints after what should have been adequate antibiotic therapy. First of all, it's possible the patient didn't take the antibiotics. You know, you give them two weeks of doxycycline and they got five days sitting in the medicine cabinet, they feel so much better, why bother, right? And, and so that way they have the antibiotics for next time that they get bitten by a tick. This is not the way we practice medicine. So it's possible they didn't take the antibiotic. It's also possible the antibiotic was not absorbed. There are some people for whom the diarrhea and, and abdominal pain from doxycycline is so great, and the same thing is true sometimes of amoxicillin, is so great that they just flush it right through their system and it never really gets absorbed. There are other people for whom it's not di diarrhea, it's just that they don't absorb it. It's possible. Uh, there are people who had more advanced disease than you identified at the time you saw them. So let's say that you see somebody with erythema migraines, the rash of Lyme disease. You give them oral antibiotics, but as it turns out, they already had meningitis. It, it was subclinical. You didn't see it. You didn't appreciate it. They come in three weeks later for a follow-up, and they say, my neck is so stiff, and I'm feeling so weak. You can do spinal tap if there are cells. You can also find antibodies against the organism, but if you find a lot of inflammatory cells, this is meningitis. This requires IV therapy, not oral therapy. So I didn't give the appropriate therapy the first time through, not because of my incompetence, but because it was subclinical. Assuming that you've given appropriate antibiotics and it was absorbed, some people will have persistence of organism, presumably. That's very ill-defined as of now but it is possible that there's persistent of organisms. All the organisms that have ever been identified, all the Borrelia burgdorferi, are sensitive to the antibiotics that we use. So it's not as though there is a resistant strain out there. But it's possible that it was in a cell someplace and, and the cell broke open, now you got the organism multiplying again. So in, in some sort of a privileged site, it's possible. Unproven, but possible. The second potential explanation is debris dead organism lying there in a joint, as an example, and it's a, it's the, a focus of ongoing inflammation because your, your macrophages are trying desperately to get rid of this residual stuff, and it's very indigestible. So there's ongoing inflammation. That's ongoing symptoms despite. And it's possible that you might have debris elsewhere in the body and have inflammation, and inflammation is causing your symptoms. Global inflammation, systemic inflammation. It's possible that what's going on in the patient is immune in, in, in mechanism, that somehow the infection has caused an immune response, not necessarily autoimmune, but an immune response, an ongoing inflammation, so it just can't be tamped down. It could be autoimmune. I must tell you that uh, Alan Steer looked at autoimmunity due to OSP-A, or centered on OSP-A. I think that that has been pretty much Dis not discredited, but demonstrated to not be of any clinical relevance. My laboratory, when I was at Robert Wood Johnson, looked at neurologic disease. We found cross-reactivity between a Borrelia burgdorferi antigen and a human antigen. The possibility of, of autoimmunity was raised. I don't, we demonstrated it in the laboratory. I don't know that we have ever seen that be of clinical relevance, but it's possible. There's no evidence to suggest that it happens, but it's possible. Ongoing immunity, autoimmunity, maybe. And the final explanation is that they once had Lyme disease, but something else is going on. So as I said before, uh, Alan, has, Alan Steer has, has shown that there are people who have chronic inflammatory diseases that have nothing to do with Lyme disease, that follow Lyme disease. Life does not come to a screeching halt medically when you eradicate Borrelia burgdorferi. Other things can happen. Are they causative? Is it that the Bieberdorferi caused rheumatoid arthritis. No reason to believe that's the case. It happened. So it's very important that you not assume, remember the, the old expression, when you assume you make an ass out of you and me? It's very important that you not assume that something that happens after Lyme disease is therefore due to the preceding Lyme disease. You have to have an open mind about this. And so you, what you need to do is approach the patient with the Lyme disease in the background, but look for other potential explanations. Does this lady have lupus? Does this lady have rheumatoid arthritis? Does this lady have amyotrophic lateral sclerosis? And then there's always, there's always the very real question, 
was the initial diagnosis of Lyme disease correct? Very frequently in a referral practice, you'll see somebody come in with a diagnosis of Lyme disease that I can't substantiate. I, I just, I, I don't know how that diagnosis was made. When I start digging through the records, there's no there there. And so it's very important that you be sure that there was really a Lyme disease diagnosis that, that is supportable in the first place. But even if there was, look for other things to make sure you don't miss something. Because the diagnosis of chronic Lyme disease is almost a diagnosis of exclusion. And, and diagnosis of exclusion is a very difficult thing to do because it means that you've excluded everything else. Not the easiest way of, of practicing medicine.